What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the PFN Scouting Podcast. I'm Ian Cummings, joined by my good friend and co-host, Derek Tate. We covered the full extent of the offensive draft board for the 2025 NFL Draft last week, talking about top players at each position, our rankings at wide receiver and running back, top fives. A lot of exciting reveals in that one. So if you missed that, you want to go check it out. You can go back to the last week. It is there. A couple weeks earlier, also, we talked about quarterbacks in depth. So that podcast is still out there. I encourage you to take a look at it. A lot of good thoughts on guys like Shadur Sanders, Jackson Dart, Donovan Smith, and other wild cards in the class. But today, we are moving to the defensive side of the ball, our soft defensive preview for the 2025 NFL Draft. And it's going to be an exciting one, Derek. I mean, this past year, what was it? There, there wasn't a defensive player picked within the first 14 picks, right? I think it was Latu. Right. Latu was the first one of 15th overall for the Colts. So it was there was a big skew in the offensive direction last year, 2024. And this this coming year, it really looks like it's gonna the the pendulum is gonna swing entirely in the other direction. So I'm excited to get into that. But first, Derek, I gotta ask, one more week into the summer. We're getting a little bit closer to the football season. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing all right, man. I'm doing all right. This always get I have a so on the fantasy side of things, I play in a lot of IDP leagues, which is always very intriguing to try to take a deep dive now that I'm kind of, you know, moonlighting a little bit with the scouting yeah. department. So getting an idea of some of these, you know, hybrid prospects that have all kinds of immense upside and, you know, trying to figure out their best fit uh, transitioning to the NFL with a lot of these, you know, linebackers that are sub 230 pounds, right? Uh, trying to figure out what their best fit is uh, when they get to the pro level. But Always a really exciting time. I mean, it's, it's the 4th of July and we're still sitting here talking college football and, you know, what, NCAA football kind of got my, my, like the video game aspect yeah. of it, too. It, it's I, it's just a great time to be a football I mean, fan. hey, what's not American if it's not college football, right? I mean, you got the American flag, <laughs> you got the national anthem, you got the fireworks and everything, the pregame celebrations. Come on, you got the, the beer and the hot dog and stuff like that. Like, that's about as American as you can get, right? So The pageantry, the pageantry man. The pageantry. I know, that's, that's the word they always use, the passion, the pageantry, the two Ps, right? But, you know, hey, that's what it is, right? So, uh, happy 4th, by the way, for those of you listening, we're recording on July 2nd right now, so a couple of days out but that's gonna be a fun time make sure you spend time with your family uh and it's it's a fun time for sure but the defensive side you mentioned it too like idp like hey it can be your secret weapon you know if you scout these defensive guys and you're kind of getting in on who's the next big thing and i feel like scouting this class has been so exciting already because there are a couple guys who have graded very highly for me the guys that i'm already looking forward to potentially being blue chip prospects at the next level and it's gonna be very exciting to see how they pan out first off I mean, we, we kind of let off last week's pod with Travis Hunter, right? So uh, did you get a chance to watch him at corner at all? And do you have a, a delineation for where you're leaning as to where he would play, right? Because I kind of gave my take last week. I would prefer him at wide receiver just because I think that brand of physicality translates more. Did you get a chance to watch him at corner? Because he's pretty talented there, too. I mean, the, the route recognition, the reading ability, the playmaking, uh, the fluidity, the speed, just all, the, all of those bedrock traits that you want are definitely there. So were you able to kind of complete the puzzle a bit? A little yeah. bit, yeah. And boy, oh boy, that route recognition yeah. is exceptional. Um, and that's why I believe I would prefer to have him on the defensive side of the football because if you have a, 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 an uberly athletically talented player that has those type of ball skills, uh, it can just wreak havoc um, for opposing offenses that – you know, you're not, it doesn't feel like you can really fool him. Sometimes it's where he, my thing with him is again, the physicality that you mentioned. And sometimes he gets a little bit too aggressive um, when it comes to trying to jump routes, which I think can be punished uh, by any offensive coordinator, but in particular, when you get to the professional ranks, um, cause there's a couple of times where I'm kind of wondering if he's in a, in a cover two scheme and, his responsibility is to try to make sure that receiver gets a must inside release, right? That's you're trying to shove, you know, keep everything inside of you. There's times where his instincts just take over. He gets a hand on the, uh, on the uh, offensive wide receiver on the outside, but then he jumps an out route. <laughs> and it's, it looks beautiful and it, it's a big play. And, and ultimately you want those uh, explosive turnovers, which he can provide in spades because of his route recognition, his athleticism. Um, but Sure, him not being a full-time corner, there's going to be a little bit more 
deficiencies, I think, with just, you know, him splitting his duties and not fully focusing on the uh, defensive side of the football, having to, you know, arguably be a top five receiver in this up, upcoming class. But his, his route recognition and, and ball skills combined with his athleticism uh, is something that I value and think can translate to being a an impact corner in the end yeah for sure and it's uh, it's gonna be a fun discussion to have down the stretch for sure but i, I will say you know like he graded out as my wide receiver one by a little bit over luther burden and, and, no. and t-mac which is crazy you get, again if you're listening you missed last week's pod i highly encourage you to check it out a lot of great discussion on those guys but he graded out as my cb3 so there's a couple corners that graded higher than him as talented as he is. And so I think that's a good segue to just get into, you know, well, first off, Derek, I want to ask you, because you've been looking at the defensive side of the ball. Were there any players that really stood out to you and impressed you a little more than the other guys? There were a couple on my board that really just stand out above the crowd and a very talented defensive class. But were there any names that really popped off to you? Guys that I think are ready to come in and be contributors in the on Sundays right now Mason Graham from yes. Michigan defensive tackle uh th- th- that he he is impressive to say the very least um whether you want to flex him inside to a one technique I think he can be a, 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 a very disruptive three technique in the NFL I mean strong hands explosive I mean you, you, how many how many times is he going to beat you know elite college offensive lineman with the pull slide move it's elite <laughs> his hand power and hand control um hand discipline is exceptional and you combine it with his uh, you know his lateral agility and ex- acceleration for a guy that size uh and he can bully you with a with a bull rush uh, boy his tape really popped out to me um would not be surprised i mean interior defensive lineman is a position in the NFL that doesn't always get the love it probably deserves on on draft day. Traditionally, we even kind of saw that this year with, I think, Johnny Newton slipping all the way to the second round. Um, but he stood out in Malachi Starks, yes. Georgia. Oh, goodness, man. <laughs> I was like, and I, I, he doesn't remind me, you know, like athletically and maybe explosive wise as far as hitting power, stopping power of a guy like Sean Taylor. But he just feels like he's always around the football. Um, his versatility kind of gives me vibes of, of Kyle Hamilton, um, a safety that can play over the top if you need him to be a single high guy, but you want him around the ball. You want him around the line of scrimmage and he can get downhill and, and give you run support, uh, stopping power in that regard. He is physical at the catch point, really effective. Uh, a lot of reps with him in man coverage against slot receivers. Uh, that type of versatility at at, at Safety is <laughs> that definitely speaks to today's NFL, to say the very least. And of course, the ball skills, uh, that interception as a freshman against Oregon. Yep. Uh, beautiful. I mean, having to basically turn his entire body around to find the ball and then elevating, high pointing it. There, there's so much special in Malachi Starks that uh, I really feel like he's got top 10 potential, uh, top 10 draft capital potential, even at safety where safeties tend not to go quite as high as um, like elite level corners or edge rushers, but Malachi Starks feels like he's that special. Yeah, and like I, I, it kind of confounds me a little bit why safeties, why blue chip safeties don't go that high, right? Because it is very important to have that kind of talent on, on your defense at the safety position, right? I mean, it's the consummate safety blanket. If he can man up against slot receivers in today's NFL, that's where a lot of teams like to isolate some of their best weapons right so you know it's one of those things where if you can fulfill a multitude of different roles i'm so glad that you brought up stars within that lens because he's actually my highest graded prospect so far he's the only prospect yep. above a blue chip talent for me i think he graded around a 9.2 on my scale so you know already he's in contention to be my highest graded safety prospect ever and i've had a few highest pretty highly graded safeties over the years you mentioned kyle hamilton definitely one of them um but malachi stars man i mean and all this is six foot one 205 he's not a small dude either i mean he's got that right. rocked up frame he's got really good proportional length too which i think helps with that playmaking range but you know you mentioned it the brand of mobility he can play single high he's got the range to close gaps and make plays on the football he can play too high easily really good pedal technique he can you know vary his technique and use side steps and shuffles and inch resets to keep hip leverage right and then in the slot and off man his twitch his recalibration quickness the hip fluidity all of those things are out of this world man so he is different malachi starks is different 
and uh, he's my top overall defender top overall prospect only blue chip guy on my preliminary board so far so he, he's a guy who could really i think if there's anyone who could rework the value of the safety position in the coming class malachi starks is that guy uh, in my opinion so i'm really glad we saw the same thing mason graham also my top defensive tackle uh, which I feel, I think this is another good place to segue to our positional rankings. I know we were trying to kind of get the hierarchy at each position, right? So it feels natural to start a defensive tackle. Mason Graham is my top DT in this class. I mean, it's kind of funny because he plays alongside Kenneth Grant, who's not a not a right. small dude either, six three, uh, three thirty nine, right? And you know he moves really well. But then you look to the, his right or to his left and you see Mason Graham, who's 6'3", 318, almost 320 pounds. There are some nose tackles in the NFL at that size. And he's out here sidestepping reach blocks, you know, one gapping just really quickly, really violently explosive, agile, like you said. But the hand strength, the torquing freedom, right? I mean, this dude is violent in every sense of the word. And he has very precise hands, too. You mentioned it on the you know pull slide moves, right? He's got club moves, chops in his arsenal. He's very good at deconstructing anchor getting around blocks and he's got a hot motor in pursuit too so mason graham yeah you know is the consummate one gapper uh but he can you know he can do multiple things too in run defense i mean he can penetrate through gaps if he wanted to win quickly he can hold the line and prevent displacement with that strong lower body and then as a pass rusher he can win one-on-one -on -one. you know i think one of my only knocks is that maybe not elite flexibility which i mean at 318 is natural but still very flexible for his size so you know all of the tools that you want i think he definitely has them i think he's a guy who can be that one gap penetrator but also hold the line when you want him to just really solid uh, a high floor, high ceiling player. Those are always the best kinds of investments. When you know there's a level of security there, but there's also that high level athletic ceiling and the high level power output that tells you this guy, he won't just, he won't just, you know, keep things steady. He will make plays for you and disrupt and then generate pressure. And that's always the best thing for sure. He's my DT one actually by a sizable margin. I think he scored, I'm looking at my, my board here, like an 8.75, somewhere around there. So that's early to mid first round on my board. A uh, big fan of what he has to offer. My next highest rated DT is Tyleek Williams from Ohio State. He's my DT2 okay. so far. And that was a surprise to me, uh, honestly, when I was running the grades because Deion Walker, and I'll get to him in a little bit. He's not too far back, so he's I, I still really love the talent there. But uh, Tyleek Williams, man, uh, another guy who's 6'3", I think 327 is what he's at now. He was mm -hmm. at around 350, I think, when he first got to Ohio State. But he cut some weight. I think he got five sacks in his true freshman season, so he's always been very productive. This past year, 10 tackles for loss, three sacks. The alignment versatility is really what gets me with this guy. I mean, he's yep. 6'3", 327, and there there were reps against Notre Dame where he's lining up against Joe Alt at 5 tech and holding the line in run defense, right? And then if you want to do a twist or a stunt, he, he's got the lower body flexibility, the ankle flexion, the explosiveness to execute those kinds of plays. Again, he's got very good, compact, efficient power output with that kind of frame where he can get underneath you. He can get narrow and he can just explode inside your torso and blow you back. Right. So, you know, he's got all of those tools that that are conducive to independent you know, pressure generation, right? But then at the same time too, you can line him up pretty much anywhere and run defense. One tech, three tech, five tech, and he's going to do his job and he's going to do what he needs to do. So Tyler Williams, I love his potential as that safety blanket on the defensive line. I think there's a lot of upside there. My DT3 and my top pure nose tackle is Kenneth Grant up from Michigan. You know, he's that guy who 6'3", 339, Moves very well for his size. Uh, there's rumors that he might run a sub five second 40 yard dash, which is, that's just absurd at that kind of size. Right? <laughs> right. It's just like you don't you don't see that kind of mobility from guys that big. But then at the same time, too, you know, I look back to the evaluation of Mozzie Smith at Michigan, right? A guy who was kind of similar role wise where they had him at zero tech and one tech a lot. Right. But I think Kenneth Grant is a lot better at limiting displacement in the run game. You know, one thing about Mozzie Smith is that, yeah, he's got the body and the strength of a nose tackle. But there were times when he was worked a little too far upright, not enough base load, yeah. and that would cause him to get moved easily. Kenneth Grant does not have that issue. Kenneth Grant is very good at leveraging himself to limit displacement. Right. And then there are reps in pass rush where this guy is doing stunts and twists alongside Mason Graham, right? And getting from the opposite. Spin side. moves and crazy exactly. crap. <laughs> like, crap like that. Like you're just looking at this, you're like, what, if, did I did I read the weight right? Like, are we are we reading the right page right? So it's it's really uncanny. And the, you, there are some times, naturally, as nose tackle, you know, the stamina, the, 
the um the amount of reps you wonder how much just how much he can take but his motor and pursuit again there are reps where he's chasing plays down the field i mean effort is never going to be an issue so you know you love to see that from a nose tackle so i think kenneth grant is the nose tackle who has the rundown utility that you really want and then he's got some pass rush upside with that frame with that weight and mass too which is even more exciting because most guys don't have that you know most guys are a little more one-dimensional i think kenneth grant defies logic there and that's pretty exciting my last dt that i'll mention my dt4 right now heading into the year is Dion walker he actually came in you know hey there we go synergy i like it um but he uh he's kind of the opposite he's the guy who is six foot six 348 and he is just a freak athlete i mean this dude moves differently there are reps where he's a five tech and seven tech as a speed to power rusher outside the tackle stand up like you're like what is going on here right so it's like, <laughs> again it's like kenneth grant there's some logic defying elements here uh the problem with Deion walker right you know six foot six 340 348 you would expect him to with that size and strength and power he's got all of those in spades and he's super athletic too he's explosive agile you know, you would expect him to hold up at the point at nose tackle, zero second, one sec, a little bit better than he does. And I think a lot of it stems from pad level. I mean, and his pad level has a lot of room to improve. And I think that's, you know, we've heard that's something that he's working on this offseason. So that's a very good sign. You know, I think if he continue to work at it, he can definitely get better because you need that base load. You need to get your base underneath you so that you can kind of absorb power and you can prevent displacement. If you get too tall, not only is that going to negate, negate the base load, but it can also make your pad level, your technique kind of lopsided, easier to lose balance right. too. And we, we see that a lot on tape where it's kind of a positive feedback loop for Walker who, who loses that because he just plays a little too tall. At six foot six, 348, I would expect it to be a little bit of an issue, right? So it's not something that concerns me. It's kind of logical. It makes sense. But if he can improve that, I think he can be a nose tackle with that all-encompassing alignment versatility to play three tech, five tech, four I, whatever you want. But right away, I mean, he de- kind of defies logic with the way that he can penetrate one gap at three tech and five tech at that size already. So, you know, heavy hands, very good motor, again, very explosive. The speed to power is definitely there. So the idea of him is a little bit better than him right now, but that's not a bad thing. He's still an early round prospect, still a guy who has that utility in certain phases, and the upside is just out of this world. So very strong defensive tackle class. I want to know, Derek, how how are we on the same wavelength for a lot of these guys? Or, or we have we have the exact same hey, top four go. in the same let's exact go. order. Um, on board with Ty Leak Williams, I love his versatility, the formation alignment versatility, his effect, effectiveness in all those roles and capacity is something that really elevates him as far as an interior defensive lineman prospect for me. Kenneth Grant and Dion Walker are two confusing cases um, because yeah, they both have you know unicorn type of size, athleticism, um, ability to like, you know, lateral agility burst and stuff of that nature. But the, the down to down consistency in particular with Walker, yeah. like it's sometimes it feels like Walker's like, you know, allowing you to read his entire Jersey, you know, <laughs> like, you know, he's, he's giving you his chest yeah. sometimes. And I want to see him fire out of his stance a little bit more consistently because he can be dominant when all those things are tied in consistently. But Far too often, it looks like he wants to win with finesse as opposed to taking that 348 pound frame and physically imposing his yeah. will on, on defenders or uh, offensive line. Excuse me. So just the the inconsistencies with it uh, is why I have like in my notes, it's a bit sloppy technically. Like there's just some aspects of his game that just aren't there yet. Uh, like and ultimately, I think the leverage is is the name of the game when you're trying to battle. I mean, obviously hand placement, there's a ton of things that go into it, but ultimately if you lose the leverage battle, you're making everything far more difficult for yourself. And I believe that Walker does that a little bit more, has those reps where you just go, dang, if you can just clean it up, like, you know, what happened on that rep? What, why, why are you get like standing straight up? Like, yeah, I, I love that you're as tall and as big as you are and as long as you are, but I, I don't want to see you standing straight up sometimes. Yeah. Uh, I want to see you uh, fire out of your stance and, and, you know, take the attack to the opponent instead of you know, basically giving uh, a, a, an inferior offensive lineman um, hope by surrendering leverage at the attack point. So those consistencies with Deion Walker are certainly the physical tools. Love it. Um, flashes of, you know, 
crazy athleticism for a guy his size are certainly there. But there, there's things about his technicality, his hand usage, hand placement and consistency um, that I think gets himself into trouble and creates a lot of um, inconsistency from rep to rep. Yeah, and the leverage is the base issue because that's the bedrock, right? Like that's kind of where it starts. If you don't have good leverage, any hand move that you try is not going to have the same amount of power behind it. And also yeah, right. it's going to be hard to stack counters when, you're not, when you don't have proper leverage, right? And it's not just the pad level too. There are times when his base is a little too narrow as well, and that can impact it as well. So there are a lot of things to work on, but you can see the talent. You can see why if he can reach his ceiling, he does have DT1 upside in this class. 348, six foot six. Again, should not be able to move that way. The, the, t- the, the tricky part is we can say that for every DT that we've mentioned so far. Mason Graham, Kenneth Grant, right? Tyleek Williams even. So you know, it's a very talented class. And I think a, a class that has an embarrassment of riches already. And there's a few other guys down the board that are worth keeping an eye on, keeping tabs on as well. So defensive line looking very strong early on. Ashton Gallette, where do you do you have him more of a, a an edge rusher? I mean, he's two seventy five, yeah. so I've kind of like I, he kind of blurs that line because I saw a lot of alignment versatility uh, last year at Louisville. So I mean, there's and you know even Nick Scorton from uh, he was with Purdue, he transferred to Texas A and M. Some of those guys kind of blurred that line. I mean, I think that they're more edge prospects. If you would probably agree with that. Um, but you know, because you know Scorton's at, at two eighty, but a lot of his reps are out at nine technique yeah. where he's kind of having to uh, identify actually part of what I like about his game is he's so disciplined when it comes to um, playing, you know, the zone read and being able to kind of eat down the space. Um, there's the, I don't see the the hyper twitch athleticism. There's times where I want to see him dominate against off like, you know, offensive tackles or even tight ends that I don't see him physically impose as well consistently, but certainly there's a lot of physical tools there that, that intrigue me with those two players that probably grade out more as edge prospects, but can give you some alignment versatility. Yeah, for sure. I'm, I'm in the same boat and this is a good opportunity, I think, to, to give my top five edges real quick. So I will, yeah. but um, no, I agree. I think uh, Gal- Ashton Jalot or Galot, I will learn how to pronounce that down the stretch. I promise. <laughs> I promise you, you all know me. I will do it eventually. Um, but Ashton is definitely a talented player. He, he caught my eye when I was watching Yaya Diaby, who went uh, in round three to the Buccaneers, I think one or two cycles ago. So uh, the talent is definitely there. 6'3", 275, but kind of like Diaby in the sense that he's well leveraged, but really good compact mass, explosive, pretty pretty flexible in its lower body too. So a lot of a lot of great power components there, but then has the speed and bend a little bit too. So excited to see what he can do. He's been productive. Uh, he's definitely on my radar. I haven't graded him yet, but I'm very excited too. Nick Scorton is another one, man. I mean, 6'4", 280. For being such a young player, I think he's still 19 years old as of this recording. Uh, so yeah, that, that's wild. wild. <laughs> yeah, that's insane. If he declares this year, he will not be 21 years old until I think at least you know right before the start or right after the start of the NFL season. I, maybe he's an August birthday. I forgot. But um, very young and already very nuanced in some elements of the game. 6'4", 280 and wins with finesse a lot more than you would expect. That spin move is lethal with him. I mean, he he, he tries it very often, maybe a little too often, I think. Uh, I, I think there, there are opportunities to vary the pass rush arsenal a little bit more with him. Um, I, I do think he can be over-reliant on that at times, and there are times where he can maybe do a little bit better job of sustaining power exertions. I mean, you're 6'4", 280. Come on, you've got the power profile. And I think he, he's shown that he can utilize it effectively. But outside of the spin move and the counters and the counter work, and he's agile, he's fluid, really like his game and his athletic profile overall. But I, I think there is room to keep building on that, right? But you mentioned it. Absolutely. Discipline in the run game is definitely a strength with him. The pursuit speed when he's able to get out in space really pops for his size. Uh, so a lot of upside there. And you got a pretty strong floor with the physical profile that's there. So I think he is my check on my board. He's my edge three entering the class. My edge four, I'll go four, five, then two, one. Uh, we'll kind of mix it up a little bit. My edge four <laughs> yeah. is James Pierce Jr. Uh, I know a favorite of a lot of people oh, from Tennessee. Wow. Yeah, a okay. little bit lower. I, I think some people have an edge one conversation. And I think the talent is definitely there. Explosive, long, uh, very streamlined as well. There are reps where he, he's got that blink speed, man, where if you're if you're a tackle and you blink, he's past you, right? You can't take any time off with this guy because if you don't get enough depth on your kick, he is getting past 
past you. Uh, just that hyper elite explosion and speed at 6'5", 242, really impressive. And he's got a pretty nice speed to power profile as well. I think sustaining power exertions, again, can be a little bit better. And I think part of that comes from a little lighter, a little leaner, lower body. Doesn't quite have the mass to sustain as well as other guys. But, you know, very explosive, very good at channeling power through momentum generation, right? The thing with James Pierce Jr. for me 6'5", 242, definitely play strength is an issue at times, especially in the run game. I don't think he's great at setting the edge and limiting displacement there. I don't think he's great at one gapping, stacking and shedding. There are flashes occasionally because he does have a long frame. He's pretty lean, so he's got that, but it's not very consistent right now. And at the same time, too, I would like to see him win with finesse and bend a little more with the profile that he has. I know I think sometimes he kind of diverts to speed to power. So I, I think, again, a guy who can vary his arsenal kind of in a, in a uniquely different way to Scorton. You know, Nick Scorton is 6'4", 280. I think he plays a little bit too much with finesse. I think he can he can activate his power element a little more. James Pierce Jr., 6'5", 242. I think he plays a little bit too much with power. I think you can unlock that finesse element a little bit more. So kind of a cool dichotomy with those two guys, but they're both both very talented and both in the first round range for me. My edge five is Princely Uman Milan, who was at Florida, transferred to Ooh. Ole Miss. I love this guy, man. Explosive, hyper elite bend capacity. There was a rep against South Carolina that I keep coming back to where, again, he gets the angle advantage within a second. I mean, the explosion is unreal with this guy. And then he cuts a 90 degree angle like a motorcycle, you know, going around a curve, like pretty much lateral parallel to the ground, bending that much while keeping speed at 6'5", 255. The physical tools are unreal with this guy. And that same flexibility really allows him to acquire leverage and pry through gaps in the run in run defense, too. I think his pass rush can still improve. And he's a little bit older than some of these other guys, too. So big year on tap for him at Ole Miss. But I'm very excited to see what he can do, because, again, the explosion, the bend, the length, um, I think activating his power arsenal is another area where he can improve a lot. You don't see a ton of power with him on tape, and I want him to improve at channeling his traits to generate that. But right now, you do have a ton of traits to work with, so that is very exciting at the very least. My edge, too, is Michael Williams from Georgia. Uh, the hand wow. usage, I want to see more from him as an independent pass rusher one-on-one before I give him the edge one mantle. But this guy has the highest ceiling in the class, and it's not a discussion for me. Uh, 6'5", 265, the dude is insanely explosive, agile. He he moves differently. And then he's got the power profile being at that size with that kind of length where he can just bowl through tackles. I love his ability to work on stunts and looping rushes as well. I think he's right. very unique in that he's explosive. He generates momentum early, but he's also really good when, when you're stunting and looping. You got to change your tracking angle at some point, right? You know, you start lateral, you got to get upfield at some point. And I think Mike Williams is very good at realigning his hips to you know, um, sustain that power channel, right? You know, to, to make sure that you're getting all of your base behind these extensions and you're just plowing through guys, right? Some guys are a little stiff. They can't do that. They can't make those quick redirections at a moment's notice. Michael Williams can. And with the freakish athleticism that he has, that makes him so much more dangerous. So again, I think as a hand, a hand usage artist right now, as a pass rushing threat, pretty underdeveloped for the the amount of experience he has but again i think this guy in the right de- in the hands of the right defensive coordinator can be just a game breaking force and then my edge one preliminary very close but uh, abdul carter from penn state and that's unique because he's played linebacker his entire career right yeah, you know I, and that's kind of a gut feel for me right that's kind of a call where I'm looking at the traits and I'm projecting a little bit, but 6'3", 250, I mean, he's got the compact mass. He's got the size to hold up as a speed finesse rusher. And there are some really bright flashes rushing around the apex where he's able to bend, cut really tight angles, explosive and flexible. And then he can supplement that with really quick, you know, swipe rip moves, right? You know, little quick counters while multitasking around the edge that show me this guy can be a game breaking pass rush threat, right? So we need to see more reps of him setting the edge and being that run defender as well i think that's the next big step for him this year but the traits again are out of this world right especially in that in that niche rush outside linebacker role that can be so valuable in the modern nfl i think he has all the tools to to do that well so those are my top edges again what are we are we do we have synergy here or is a little different no we 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 don't because it's hard to the conversation with Abdul Carter, James Pierce Jr., and even sprinkle in like Harold Perkins. Yeah. Like, <laughs> who is an edge and who is a linebacker, right? Um, so I do have Carter as my edge one. 
Um, I've got Pierce as my edge two, Scorton as three, and then Williams at four. Um, and then, like you said, we, there's some other prospects like, you know, Ashton Gillette. And then uh, even I'm interested in your thoughts on Howard Cross, the third over at Notre Dame, um, because there was a rep. You talk about bend and, and being able to, to, you know, run the apex. I mean, he did it from the A gap against Duke <laughs> in one rep where his body's at like 45 degrees and he's still accelerating. It's wild. Uh, it, it was a wild rep again. Uh, but lining up at zero technique, you know, and at 284 pounds, is he is he an edge? Is he kind of blur the line with, uh, you know, an interior defensive prospect? Um, you know, certainly that's a conversation that we could certainly have. But he came in at five for me. Abdul Carter and James Pierce both flash incredible ability. Um, you know, I'm a little bit more intrigued, though, by Carter because he does have those off ball reps. Uh, they do drop him in coverage. There's a tendency, though, with Carter a little bit to overrun plays. Um, I think that he, he's a little bit too aggressive in pursuit sometimes, and that can get him in trouble. Uh, it's not that he doesn't have the athleticism, athleticism to be able to sink his hips, hips stop, swivel um, when a, a ball carrier tries to change direction on him. But there's times where he overruns a little bit. And I, I just there there's. He kind of feels a little positionless, but he certainly has all the tools because, boy, I have in my notes attack Mm. like six times. (laughs) This dude attacks and gets downhill and he's got the burst that just is blinding for a guy that's 250 pounds. Um, I believe that, yeah, you're probably I'm on I'm on board with you that I think he probably translates and his game is going to get folks at the NFL level pretty excited about him as an edge prospect because there's a lot of reps that are very encouraging despite not spending um, full time there. Because, I mean, what Penn State just put in Chop Robinson uh, and Idisa Isaac uh, as kind of their edge prospect. So it's easy. It kind of makes sense why we saw a lot of Abdul Carter. Um, playing as an off-ball linebacker last year. Yeah, for sure. And it's it's impressive that he grades that highly just off of raw trades pretty much. I mean, there there, there are there are examples of, of proper hand usage already in that in that limited sample size, but we need the sample size to get bigger. That's pretty much the extent of it, right? So I think if we can do that, I think all of the traits are there to, again, be that game-breaking speed, finesse, bend, rusher, right, who can activate compact power with his hands and with that hip rotation. So very excited for that. And they have another guy on the other side as well, Danny Dennis Sutton, who's coming – uh, he's, mm-hmm. he's flashed a little bit in past years, and he'll get an opportunity this year athletically – he reminded me a little bit of Jason Pierre-Paul. Really big, really efficient Ooh. mover, right? Who's got that power element to him. So, But he's got some nice closing speed when he's able to open up his strides, too. So another fun player. Uh, Howard Cross is a fun one, man. I got to get a grade on him. I haven't gotten a grade on him yet. But um, I've had my feel is that kind of how we looked at Johnny Newton last year, right? There were a few reps where he was at three-tech or two-wide and looping out to five-tech and using Ben to get around that guy, right? I think Howard Cross, from what I've seen, with this physical profile, I would probably keep him as an interior guy first. But it's really great to have a guy like that who can stunt outside and stress tackles with, you know, with those looping looks. So uh, the versatility is very good. I, I got to get a look at him. I got to get a grade on him for sure. But another guy who's definitely in that discussion. Uh, so it's a fun class. It really is a lot of varying molds. And I think that's what's very apparent early on. Where do you want to go next, though? We still got some ground. To cover. <laughs> I did, uh, we got we got what? We're, we're 33 minutes in. Uh I'm looking at cor- let's go to DB. Yeah, I think that we, we got to give some we got to give the corners and, and some safeties a little bit of love here. We, get, we that, that conversation at linebacker is always interesting. But uh, yeah, let, the cornerback position, you have so you said you have Hunter as your cornerback yeah. three. I'll, I'll give you my my top four. I've got uh, Takario Davis from Arizona. He's your CB one. Uh, he's my he's four. four. Okay, he's I my, was like, oh, he's my. I four. like it. It's bold. He's but my, I like it. Um, Ben Morrison as my uh, from Notre Dame as my cornerback three, Travis Hunter as my cornerback two, and then uh, for me it's pretty pretty handily Will Johnson uh, as the cornerback one from Michigan in this uh, in this class. Will Johnson is my CB one as well, uh, and I I agree he's definitely he can be special he really can six two two zero two. 
with the traits that he has, right? I, the short area twitch is really what got me. You know, this dude is so yeah. energized when he's recalibrating and planning and driving, right? You know, the click and close for a guy this big it is very impressive. There were some reps against Marvin Harrison Jr. where that stood out completely in the spotlight where, you know, right away, instant reaction speed, instant calibration with his lower body, and then the closing speed, the explosion, and the physicality to make the play at the catch point as well. You know, he's got the ball skills for it too. So he's my CB1. Very close behind him. Not not very reasonably close behind him. I got Benjamin Morrison as my CB2. So okay. Benjamin Morrison, a little bit smaller, six foot, 185, a little bit lighter. And I do think that can hurt him at times, but he does play beyond his frame. I think he's a lot more physical than you would expect for a guy that size. And, you know, I'm trying to think of an analogy here. It's an analogy I've used before. Oh, yeah. I, okay. I remembered it. Uh, so you ever went camping as a kid, you know, and you go down to the river and you see those little water bugs, right? You know, they're kind of just like scatting yeah. around, you know, like they're, they're, they're idle. And then all of a sudden they're not, you know, there's kind of jitterbug. He's got that quickness to me where he's just he can be idle and then moving just in an instant. Right. You know, flip a switch like he's so twitchy, so energetic, uh, just an effervescent short area mover. Any move you kind of you make on this guy, he's going to match you and he's going to recalibrate and he's going to limit space. I mean, I think to me, Will Johnson can play man or zone, but I think with his, um, you know, calibration quickness, with his twitch and range as a playmaker, he and uh, his route recognition as well. I mean, he's a great processor and he's shown that for sure. I almost think he's he's got more proficiency in zone and Ben Morrison has a little bit more proficiency in man but with his water bug quickness playing like a gnat in coverage, right? Close quarters. But I think they both have that schematic versatility where they can play in either one and they can be very good. So those are my top two. Travis Hunter is my CB3. Again, we talked about it at length earlier, but the route recognition of playmaking, the athletic profile, all those things are very strong with him. My CB4 is actually Jordan Hancock from Ohio State. Uh, he is a fun Ooh. player, man. And I, he broke out last year. I mean, he didn't have a ton of experience before 2023, but he played, he was the glue guy of that secondary. And I kind of overlooked it. You know, Denzel Burke, who's my CB5, I think Takario Davis is my CB6, I believe. So he's he's close. I, I like his game a lot. Um, he's fluid for his size, being 6'4", as long as he is. It's pretty freaky. Blank. It's, it's yeah. freaky, man. He's explosive, too. He's got deep speed. I think he's a very solid player. I think kind of in the mold of, Tariq Woolen, maybe a slightly less fast, but more technically sound Tariq Woolen, right? That's kind of the vibes that I was getting where you put him in a cover three scheme. I don't think he has elite fluidity. That was kind of the hang up for me, naturally being at 6'4". There are times on in-breaking rounds where maybe you struggle to sink and redirect a little bit. But as that cover three albatross, I mean, he's so long and rangy and he's got really good really good zone technique i think i think he's very good at varying his strides and playing side saddle and just keeping guys in his hip pocket uh so i like takario davis a lot but denzel burke my cb5 and then jordan hancock uh, jordan hancock really flew under the radar for me last year i think he was the glue guy of that ohio state secondary and he's got some trent mcduffie to me personally uh, I, I love how burke versatile oh, he is he okay. can play the slot he can play a little bit of boundary they even put him at safety for a few reps as well whatever he needed to play he was playing. He's a little bit bigger, a little bit taller than McDuffie. McDuffie might have been a little bit more energetic and fluid in short ranges, but McDuffie was a freak. So that's not a slight on Hancock. But um, Hancock is explosive. He is very physical. He will get right inside your frame and run support. I love how eagerly he attacks plays plays at a very high pace and he's instinctive. He, he reads things very well. He can play a number of different roles. He's got all the tools, I think, to be that kind of Swiss Army nice, that that chess piece in the back end. So my CB4, big fan of Hancock. But, you know, in general, the CB class, very strong. And I think you look at the top few guys, Will Johnson, Ben Morrison, Takario Davis, you know, th those six really stood out to me on first viewing. And there, there were a few other guys that I liked. Ephesians Prysock, who was also at Arizona, but transferred to Washington. By the way, how about that for a name? Ephesians Prysock. That's that's right. an all name team, first team all name <laughs> right away. But um, he's a fun player, too. He's long, explosive. I think he's a little bit more twitchy and fluid than Takario Davis. But Takario Davis, to me, had better technique and kind of smoothness to his game. So, you know, it's a fun class. It really is. Are there any other guys that we neglected to mention that are kind of uh, still bouncing around in your mind? No, I just wanted to mention uh, on my notes for Morrison, I had Mosquito. Mosquito, yeah. Like, yeah. Like a dude that just sticks to <laughs> like and or or a movable mirror because yeah. I agree with that like that short area, um, you know, change of direction, agility. I, I I have it written in there as teleports. 
like man can just wherever you go, he can get there in an instant. Like it, it, he is, there's some movement skills that are, that are pretty yeah. special. Whatever, um, whatever annoying to, bug what's... analogy you want to use, like just, just pick from, <laughs> pick from the, the catalog here and we'll, we'll give it to you. Uh, he's definitely got that for sure. But yeah, there's, there's a level of, of short area quickness. I, I, I think, you know, you always need that as a corner, but Ben Morrison has it to the degree, to the degree. And I think Will Johnson has it for his size is very impressive, but Ben Morrison, just takes it to another level. I mean, this dude is hyper elite in that category, and I think it's going to really help him succeed in man coverage. And then again, being at 185 pounds, I think he's a lot. He he surprised me, pleasantly surprised me with how eager and willing he is to jam guys and play physical at the catch point as well. Uh, natural playmaker. I actually gave him a better ball skills score than Will Johnson because I think Will Johnson is a great turnover threat. I think when there's an interception opportunity, he can get it for sure. I do think there are times where he can improve a little bit at at tracking the ball over his shoulder on the vertical plane. Ben Morrison knows not only how to generate turnovers, but also generate incompletions, which can be just as important when it's second or third down and you're trying to stall momentum too. So uh, Ben Morrison, the consummate playmaker with that gnat, water bug, mosquito, whatever analogy you want to use, that kind of matching athleticism is is very rare and very impressive when you do see it. So the corner class is, is very exciting. Um, and I think all these guys have immense potential, but, uh, defensive back, you want to go to safety a little bit? Are there any other, I'll, I'll just touch on safety real quick. And by the way, this Notre Dame defense is loaded yeah. heading, heading into the season. Xavier Watts is actually my, uh, my safety yeah, too. seven interceptions last um, year. Another playmaker. Boy, oh boy. He was always around the football. I mean, he's not quite the, the physical run presence consistently that maybe I, I tend to value, but his ball skills are elite. He, he, he is um, disruptive at, at the catch point too. When he is around there, he's a lot of single high reps though, which make it a little bit difficult mm-hmm. to, um, you know, give him a, a full idea of how he can operate uh, at in contested catch situations, because it, it, there's a lot of reps with him where he's, you know, you know, 10, 15 yards, 20 yards down the football field. But, um, the flashes of ball skills are, are there in spades. I mean, his game against USC was a master class. He was all he was over giving Caleb Williams field. fits, man. And people people ran with that for months, man. That was that was the game that if there was anyone doubting Caleb Williams down the stretch, that was the game they would cite for better or worse. Right. And, you know, I was looking at it like, you know, hey, everyone has bad games and he rebounded after that. Right. But Xavier Watts, you got to give the dude his flowers. He was really terrorizing Caleb Williams, especially in those short and intermediate zones. I mean, reading the ball, cool. making a play on it, closing. He was putting on a clinic in that game. So the instincts, the playmaking definitely there. And uh, at safety three, real quick, uh, Xavier, another Xavier, Xavier Wonk, Wonkpa. I Ooh, think I yeah, got it right. Iowa, uh, Iowa sure. six two. I mean, the Iowa defense. Too. I mean, speaking of Iowa, like another uh, linebacker that's actually coming back is Jay Higgins, uh, who I actually kind of like in this class as well. Just a, a stout. Um, it just fits what Iowa does, right? When you think of Iowa football, you think physical discipline, and both of these players kind of jump to jump to the mind for that. So. Um, yeah, those are the uh, those are the, the two Xavier's take the two and three spot behind Malachi Starks, but uh, Malachi is kind, of, in my opinion, in a uh, in a class. Oh yeah, own. for sure. For me, it's Malachi, then another class, then another class, and then the next few guys. It's, <laughs> and it's not that's not a slight on the other guys. This should, Malachi Starks is that different, man. You know, and I I feel comfortable saying that. Right, you never want to resort to hyperbole as an analyst, as an evaluator. Right, you want to stay rooted in the diagnostics. But the diagnostics for Malachi Starks, I mean, he entered the fold as a true freshman and was productive right out of the gate. And then this past year, just any role that you want him to fulfill. I mean, single high, two high, slot, support defender, right? Enforcing and run support, he can do that as well. The versatility, the athletic profile, the instincts, the processing ability, and then the playmaking. I, I, I don't know if there's a if there's a true weakness in this profile, aside from maybe not having elite size, right? And he's got good size for sure, just not a Kyle Hamilton, right? But again, I think you go back to the versatility, the all-encompassing versatility. He's not a master of none. I mean, this, this is a guy who can do it all. And I, I'm really, really bullish on the projection because you don't see a lot of those guys at the NFL level who have the center fielder range and playmaking ability, but can also play underneath, right? Can also play the slot, right? So I'm uh, very excited to see what he can do and where he can go because this is an evaluation that I'm going to be kind of, I'm going to be fighting with myself. Like, am I 
not overthinking this enough? Am I, are there things that I'm missing? Because right now I don't see a ton of things to nitpick with Malachi Starks. He, he feels like one of the best safety prospects that we've seen in a long time. And I'm excited to see what he can do. But uh, a few other guys farther down the board for me, my safety too at the moment. And safety is a position that's a little more, I, I, me personally, I tend to have more variance with this position year over year. Like I look at my list and who I grade out. Sometimes I, there's a guy that maybe is my eighth safety that I end up grading and I, and I, and I grade him out. He's my safety too, right? So it's like, oh, you know, I was overlooking him a little bit. So safety is a very unique position because you have a lot of different molds and the grades can come out with a little more variance than you'd expect. But um, Jeremiah Cooper from Iowa State is my safety too right now. Uh, I'm, I'm a fan okay. of what he has to offer. Again, he can play single high, two high, not as big. He's six foot, 185, but a former wide receiver. So he's got a lot of playmaking ability, the ball skills. I think he had one or yep. two pick sixes last year. So very productive player, five interceptions, 10 deflections, twitched up, hyperactive, short area guy. He can play the slot if you want to. He's explosive. The closing speed coming downhill is definitely there. Um, he just doesn't hold up quite as well physically being six foot 185. But again, a playmaker Correct. with that coverage versatility, big fan. I still like Andrew Makuba uh, from Clemson. He transferred to Texas this offseason, but he's got some he's got some nickel utility. I think, again, the twitch, the, the elastic athleticism and flexibility, the hip fluidity, all of those things kind of translate to a really impressive coverage framework and fail safe when he's recovering, when he needs to get into the proper hip alignment. So I, I think 5'11", 6 foot, 185. So again, a little underweight, a little undersized. And that shows up when he's out muscled at stems. Keon Coleman bullied him a couple of times last year when they played. Yeah. So definitely to kind of improve your physicality and, and, and uh, play strength before you make the NFL leap. But Makuba is a fun player. I like him a lot. Xavier Nwankpa is on my top five as well i like this guy a lot and what's exciting for me personally is that i think the best is still yet to come i look at you know his natural talent in high school he was a four-year starter on the varsity level and i think he had 16 interceptions over that stretch uh so this dude is the instinctive playmaker he is the guy who can make plays in the back end and he's six foot two 210 so really good size really good play strength explosive nimble i mean you watch him play and just the way that he moves you can tell he's got it for sure you can tell he has that elite level of athleticism where he can play center fielder he can come downhill if you want the biggest thing for me I need to see the technique take a step up and that's fine last year was his first full-time starting season so you can expect some aberrations for sure but my, my main takeaway from xavier nuangpa's film is i need to see more weaving you know like back pedal and adjust your track as you're pedaling right a lot of side steps a lot of reps where he's trying to square up but he's locking out his hips on transitions so when he has to break on the ball when you're weaving when you're pedaling you can stay leveraged with the guy ahead of you, right? So then you can just plant and drive really quickly. But when you're sidestepping, right, if you're trying to align yourself Balance. left or right, you're already locking your hips out that way. So when you need to redirect, if someone baits you on an in and out, right, like all of a sudden, oh, I'm over here, I gotta divert, right? So I wanna see him play with a little more discipline with his technique and his leveraging with, with this hip leverage. But again, the range is there, the, the calibration quickness, like we've talked about with a few of these guys, it's there with Nuangpa at six foot two, two ten, And that's very exciting. And then, um, you know, the run support ability, he's, he can, he's shown he can play physical in support. He's got the change of direction to correct his tackling angles. So again, a lot of upside for sure. And I think that I'm very excited to see what he can do. He's, he's another guy who you get the sense that there's still, we're still kind of, climbing up that that path for him right like the, yeah. he's got the talent for sure we just need to see a greater sample size we need to see more reps so again very exciting uh sebastian castro also on the iowa defense got to give a shout out he's going to be an older rookie he'll turn 25 late in his rookie season but this dude is a homing missile very physical very instinctive can play the slot can play support uh safety in the in the um in the flats and, and make plays against screens and things like that sebastian castro is another guy who i you know i don't know if he goes day two i would take him late day two personally I think he can be a very good NFL defender. I think in a niche role, you know, maybe an attacking slot hybrid, right? You know, strong safety slot hybrid. He can be a really productive player because he's got the instincts, the physicality, the closing speed. All of those things are there with him. So a fun group overall. But um, we got a little bit more time. You want to touch on linebacker real quick? I know Harold Perkins has been the um, – yeah. we got to talk about him. We can't yeah. end without talking about Harold Perkins. Real right. quick, my, my <laughs> linebacker rankings. So I got Jai Sean Barham from Michigan. Or he was from Maryland. He transferred to Michigan. My LB1, I, he needs to improve in coverage, but all the tools are there. 
Uh, Barrett Carter is actually slightly over Perkins for LB2 for me. So I got Perkins LB3. Barrett Carter, love his coverage versatility, love the, you know, attack versatility that he has. Very fluid, twitched up player. And then Harold Perkins is my LB3 right now. So I guess the conversation is where does Harold Perkins play at the next level? You mentioned it earlier. <laughs> Edge has been mentioned, but he's six foot one, two fifteen, right? So I, I, I know, I know. I struggle with he's going to hold up there, but I, at the same time, I think in, a, in an attacking will linebacker role where he can be that speed rusher from depth, right? I do think there's a role for him where you can weaponize him on that. You can't put him there every down, right? But I think you do have to indulge the versatility a little bit because he is so talented, right? What, what what's your take on that? I, I want him off yeah. ball. I, I don't, I don't want him as a full-time edge. Uh, I mean, I, I think he'd have to probably gain about, you know, 20, 30 pounds yeah. <laughs> to, to operate there full time. Cause if, if you ask him to anchor down against offensive tackles in the run game uh, on the line of scrimmage, you're going to have problems. Um, but that ability to, to, he looks like a safety going sideline to yeah. sideline. His, his movement skills at the linebacker position are, I both, I think they flirt with elite, like his acceleration, his burst, uh, his change of direction, like those things uh, like jumped off the tape to me. Problem is, you know, where is his best fit? I mean, probably I I would, it feels like a day, uh, you know, uh, a dated scheme. I would love to see him as maybe a potential will linebacker in like a four, three scheme. Um, and then you occasionally on pass rushing downs, you know, you know, just set him loose, um, as as an edge rusher, but there's not enough variance right now. Uh, I I don't think that he's going to have enough power to be able to overwhelm offensive tackles, uh, at the NFL level, uh, consistently off the edge. Like he's going to have to win with pure speed and burst and he can do that. He can give you a little bit of that. I, but I'd rather have him operating off ball and bring him as a linebacker screaming from the second level, which I think he can do very well and very effectively because there is some nice, uh, timing instincts that I saw. I also think that he can flex back and, and feel comfortable in coverage, uh, in particular in zone coverage. Um, I really like his ability to to diagnose and then in open field. I think he's one of the best. I think he is the best tackler uh, in in this in this class uh, as far as a linebacker prospect. Um, so that's why Perkins is actually my linebacker right. one. Um, I'm with you. I have Barrett Carter at two, and then. I, I'm, I'm struggling because I really like Jay Higgins from from Iowa, uh, but Barham, I think, op- gives me a little bit more upside as far as the physical tools uh, that get me excited. Give him the nod at linebacker three, and then uh, Higgins comes in at four for me. And then Jason Henderson from Old Dominion. Small at school five. shout out. I love it. Small school shout out tackling machine. Um, the only thing is his, his athleticism and weight at the next level. Uh, does concern me a little bit. I, I think that there's times where it gets far a little too often, get kind of caught up in the wash um, in the run game. And there's some athleticism limitations when it comes to his translation to the next level that make me wonder how effectively he can operate in space in coverage consistently. And, and there's one other thing that I saw with uh, with his tape as well for Henderson. He does tend to bite up a little bit too aggressively on play actions. Like I, maybe I'm nitpicking a little bit, but when you have those uh, responsibilities in coverage, you, as soon as you make that 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 pass read, you got to get back. You can't just hover around the line of scrimmage. And there was a little bit of inconsistencies when it came to that that left the uh, the monarch defense a little exposed on the second level because he's a little too aggressive yeah. at times trying to make a difference in the run. Linebacker is a tough position, right? Because I always feel bad when I'm nitpicking, but at the same time, it is a position where you kind of have pressure on both sides, right? Like you got to manage yeah. gaps, and then you've got to manage blind spots and coverage behind you. So you know, playing the second level and the middle of the defense that can put you in a really tough spot for offense so yeah you know i don't want to nitpick but at the same time there is a lot of pressure if you're a second level defender at the nfl level so the margin for error is pretty slim but um yeah i mean i think there's talent i think there's small school sleepers i think there are guys to keep an eye on for sure harold perkins one thing i need to see from him before we get him to lb1 for me personally is you know 
a lot of the times, I feel like these past two years, he's kind of been that reactive run and chase linebacker, right? Where, yeah, you can just use him to attack as a pass rusher or from, you know, different gap looks, like you said, right? When he's rushing from depth, he can rush through A gap, B gap, you know, around the C gap as well. So uh, there's a lot more variability for how you utilize him to weaponize him as a pass rusher if you use him from depth. Whereas, you know, if you only use him as that nine tech, right? I think he'd be used there too, but you want to maintain flexibility. But if he's going to play off ball linebacker at the NFL level, I got to see how he stacks and sheds in congested areas, you know, against inside runs and, and zone runs to the outside, right? I got to see how he stacks and sheds and manages congestion and, and kind of deconstructs blocks. And I got to, I need to see a little more improvement in coverage. I think he has the athleticism. I think he sh- flashes the route recognition, but there are times when he flips his hips a little too early and gives up hip leverage ahead of breaks, and that can tie him up a little bit, right? So I, even there, while the athleticism is there, I think the instincts can improve a little bit, but you are working with a very dynamic talent, like you said. I think he was clocked at a 4-4-9, 40-yard dash coming out of high school. So the range, the explosion, the change of direction, all of these things are, are very much in the premier tier for him. So a fun class overall on the defensive side of the ball. And over the ensuing weeks, we will have more analysis for the full 2025 NFL draft. Now that we've given our soft preview of offense and defense, we can start to get into the weeds a little bit more. So very excited for that process. It's going to be fun. But for today, we are out of time. We have been talking a lot. We're at 55 minutes. So we're going to wrap it up. Uh, Thank you, as always, for listening. Uh, if you want any more NFL draft content for the 2025 class, like I said a couple times at the beginning, just uh, kind of rewind a little bit. One week, two weeks. we got a, a few podcasts out by now. Offense, quarterbacks, whatever you want. And we will have more in the near future. Until next time, thank you, everyone. Peace out. Have a good one.